During the time my mother was pregnant, relatives said that they heard her say that she was sure she was having a baby girl. And relatives confirmed throughout her pregnancy that she didn't change her mind about that at all. She was adamant about the fact that she was not going to have a boy whatsoever. So the day of my birth, she was quite disappointed. Um, I wasn't something she could simply take back to the store. It wasn't a gift you could return. And before I was the age of two years old, she had broken my arm in two different places on two different occasions. Thankfully, my father was an Air Force career guy who uh, came home once in a while after uh, uh, being out on assignment. And he found that one day my arm was in a sling and asked why. And my mother said uh, that I had bursitis. Well, typically you get bursitis about the age I am now, not when you're two years old. He had relatives in San Diego, brothers and sisters, who he said, can you help me out here? And took me um, and placed me in their home. And they had difficulty with me because I was acting out with temper tantrums. Um, they took me and put me in uh, various aunts and uncles' homes for a while and then decided they would return me to my mom in case it was just a phase that she had been going through. But when I got back, Within 30 days, they said that my father needed to have me removed or the state would remove me. Now, my aunt and uncle were Seventh-day Adventists, and they had been praying about this. And they told my dad that they would be willing to adopt me. Um, they wanted a permanent adoption because they didn't want me being passed around anymore, and they felt that grounding uh, was necessary for me to have a, a normal life. But what they didn't recognize or know at that time was the damage that had already been done. Now everybody has, everybody that's gay has a different story. So I wouldn't want anybody who's watching this to think that there's just one commonality um, to becoming gay. But this was my story, this was my circumstances. And so because of the abuse of my natural mother, I wasn't going to be running immediately to the arms of a woman and finding comfort there. In fact, my mother, after my uh, aunt and uncle adopted me, my, my aunt, I referred to her as my mother from that point on. And they would put me in the arms of other relatives or women that would visit and I would scream and yell, put me down, put me down, I hate women, I hate women. So the damage had really been done. And before I was three years old, I was running around the house and I was screaming, I don't want to be a boy, I want to be a girl, I want to be a girl. Well, now my parents weren't sure exactly what they'd gotten themselves into, and there was certainly a lot of praying. Uh, when I went to school, the, the first day of school, I was already teased and harassed, and that happened until the very last day of school. I made up my mind that if I could get through school, I'd never step my, my foot inside another classroom. God really saw me through that time, but Satan took opportunity to say, um, at a disadvantage that he could work my feelings and because now my feelings were drawn towards wanting the affirmation and comfort in a man then no one was speaking to that. Uh, I, I went to some psychologists, I talked to teachers, I talked to pastors, nobody had the answers. Nobody had a clue what to say and as I was reading God's Word I found that everywhere um, there was a mention of homosexuality, it seemed to describe who I was. And I was very uh, studious in God's Word. My parents had uh, worship in the morning and in the evening and, and on uh, uh, going to church and Sabbath school, uh, Bible studies. You know, I knew quite a bit about God's Word. And what I couldn't find was any comfort in who I was becoming. I began to talk to Sabbath school teachers, to pastors, but there were no answers for me. There was nothing that could describe why I had the feelings that I had. And people would say, you know, you needed a personal relationship with Jesus. But what is a personal relationship with Jesus? And what I would find in the years ahead of me that I never could get to the bottom of what that answer was. And since nobody was reaching out and helping me at the age of 18, I turned my back on the church and walked away. And the first person that I ran into was someone about the same age as me who had gone to La Sierra College and he said, you know, Wayne, um, Adventism breeds homosexuality. And I said, what do you mean by that? 
that sounds weird. That's a bizarre statement to make. And he said, well, look, I know other guys like you and I, and what does the church tell you? They just tell you it's sin. They can't tell you what to do about it. And so from there, I ended up exiting the church and lived my life uh, in the gay lifestyle for almost the next 40 years. I made up my mind that everything I had been taught was dumped. Temperance, beliefs, everything was all thrown out the window and I started doing every drug I could possibly imagine doing. I decided I would do everything at least once. I indulged in, in as much sex as I could find, and that began, that began the, the addiction. I was a bit concerned about myself. I'd already had a couple of bouts with hepatitis and figured I would end up getting AIDS and dying from that, but God spared me. I would pray to Him and I'd say, let me come back HIV negative on this drug test and I'll do something for you. <laughs> like I could do that. But time progressed and friends kept dropping off. And a few years later, I got to the end of my rope after living a highly um, intemperate life. And I was sitting in my bedroom in front of my computer one morning and I contemplated the fact that every last one of my friends were now dead. And I said, and why am I still here? And I heard God say to me, so, can you hear me now? Well, it was vivid. It was an intense, incredible moment. It was, it was like something I'd never experienced before because it rang through because I didn't recognize before that I had such questions about my destiny. I had been do so distracted by friends, by parties, by drugs, by everything else that had been going on in my life. And I couldn't hear God during that time. So God has to get us to a place where we can hear Him. And sometimes He removes all the extracurricular so that we can actually begin to hear what he's saying. And I heard him say to me that I want an intimate relationship with you. And I thought, wow, what does that mean? <laughs> what is an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ? You know, is it a prayer in the morning, in the evening, you worship and, and go into church? Is that what it's about? Well, somehow he would began to introduce himself to me through his word and through my prayer time with him, that I began to get acquainted with Jesus Christ. And I began to find that the things that he talked about in his word were actually things that would draw me closer to him if I would follow him. And so I began to, to really um, commit myself to him. And I found myself on my knees and I said, you know, I'm a worthless man at this point with all that's gone in my life. Uh, I, ha I have no reason for, for being here, no reason for survival, but somehow I believe that you have preserved me. And as I recognized what he was saying to me throughout his word, I, w I began to realize that what I needed to do was to abide in Christ. That, that constant and total surrender would put me into a relationship with Jesus Christ that I had never known before. At the same time, as I went to the church, the church seemed like they didn't have a clue about what was going on and that surprised me because I thought in the four, nearly 40 years that I had been gone that the church would have been doing something about learning how to reach out. But as it turns out, it seemed like the church was wandering for the same 40 years and I began to think about the Israelites. <laughs> and today it rings true because I see what Laodicea has meant. And I see that we, for a long time, got wrapped around denominational beliefs, and we weren't wrapped around God's love. And we didn't have God's love uh, reflecting through us so that other people could begin to see the reflection of Jesus Christ that He wants people to see. Because that we are, as His children, we are His drawing power. Or his power through us is the, is the drawing that, that should be there by us representing and showing people that we love them in spite of their sin. Because like it says in, in uh, Romans, I think, 8.1, it says that there's, there is now therefore no condemnation. And so God didn't condemn us while we were still sinners. He died for us while we were sinners. And I began to really 
fall in love with Jesus, starting to fall in love with Jesus. I pray every day to fall more and more in love with him and to let him lead and guide in my life instead of what the flesh calls out for. Now Satan, he has a whole different kind of uh, idea going on about how he can um, speak to the flesh and through our feelings. And that's what he did to me for nearly those 40 years. But as we come to find out, uh, you don't always act on your feelings. Sometimes acting on your feelings gets you in a whole lot of trouble. So just because something feels natural doesn't necessarily mean that it's right. And that, I think, to the person who is struggling, who is gay, when you recognize that, that, that what God is calling us to is to, to finding out, not just hearsay, but diving for ourselves right into His Word to begin to, to see what God is saying to us. And as we find out what God is saying to us, then that intimate relationship begins to build. And then you begin to think, wow, if, if I, I think God can, because God is an awesome, powerful God, that He's giving me strength. And each day that I'm abiding in Him, the feelings are not as severe as they were when I was living without him. And so it's a turning over of self. It's dying to self. He, he tells us throughout the New Testament, he talks about dying to self. And so some people would say, well, you, aren't you a very lonely person today? You know, you don't have, any, you don't have anyone to hold on to, no, no warmth. But you know, I've come to a point where I have that intimate relationship with Jesus. I hang on to him and he hangs on to me. And my life is full now. And it was empty before. I ran around looking for more and more stuff. The more I filled myself of the flesh, the more empty I seem to have been. Jesus doesn't leave me like that. He fills me up more and more each day and he helps me fall in love with him. And, and the more stuff he fills me with, um, the more I want to do my best for him. And I found a new identity. I found an identity in him that no one can take away from me. And that's in 2 Corinthians 5.17 where he tells me that when I surrender myself to him and ask forgiveness that he makes me a new creation in him. And that's who I am today. I'm not gay. I'm not straight. I'm a child of God and I'm blessed by him and I want to serve him and I want to do his will and not mine.